Welcome back to Sunday Night in America. The midterms are finally over. Raphael Warnock defeated Herschel Walker for the last seat in the U.S. Senate. Democrats briefly had a 51-49 majority, but then Kirsten Sinema announced she's becoming an independent. So she and Democrat Joe Manchin will once again have influence over the balance of power in the Senate. Republicans had a chance to control the Senate themselves. Winnable races were lost in Pennsylvania and Arizona and Georgia and New Hampshire and Nevada. Win just two of these races. And the GOP isn't relying on the independence of political rivals. The House will be controlled by Republicans, although control might not be the right word. Rather than coalescing around a legislative or investigative agenda, House Republicans are fighting with themselves over who will be the speaker. Yes, your memory is correct. The primary for speaker was a month ago. Kevin McCarthy won with 85% of the vote, but a small yet vocal group of House Republicans will not support the winner of the primary. So much for elections having consequences or respecting the will of the people or whatever platitudes uttered but only when convenient. This small band of Republican kamikazes are convinced Donald Trump won the presidency in 2020 with 47% of the vote, yet somehow Kevin McCarthy lost the speaker's race with 85% of the vote. Math uh, never was their strong suit. Now on to 2024, the Senate map is much more favorable for Republicans, but only if they figure out how, how and why they underperformed in 2022. Americans clearly do not like the direction the country is headed in, and yet, when given the chance to change drivers, it was a mixed verdict at best. So what are the lessons? How and why did GOP candidates underperform in the Senate? Why was the margin not higher in the House? There were bright spots. Some Republican governors had overwhelming victories. Inroads were made in states like New York and California. Some senators won by landslide margins, and the House did switch hands. But on balance, most Republicans believe 2022 was a missed opportunity. Why? And what now? Joining us now is Nebraska Congressman Don Bacon. Congressman, thank you so much for joining us. All right, let, let's, you, let's start with this. Rather than Republicans praying for the good health of Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema, uh, I mean, there was a chance to win the Senate. What do you think went wrong during the midterms, both on the Senate, I mean, losing control, not gaining control, and even this narrow margin in the House? What's your assessment of it? Well, first, Trey, thanks for having me on. <clears throat> and I want to thank you, too. You're one of the first congressmen to support me when I was a challenger in 2016. I've been digging through the numbers all weekend with a couple of uh, pollsters that have really dug deep into this. I think this election came down to two things. First of all, we gotta be happy we did take back the House. It's only the third time since 1952 that the Republicans have regained control. But we should have done much better, and we should have taken over the, the Senate as well. But there are two driving factors, I believe, what happened. First, the intensity level for both Republicans and Democrats were about the same. Historically, the party out of power tends to have a much more energy level. And, but this time, the Democrats matched the intensity level. And I think abortion was a factor there, but also the fact that President Trump was also putting himself back into the picture. And I think also quali or candidate quality factors also mattered here. The second driver was the independent voters. Typically, in the off year, the party out of power gets about two to one support from the independent swing voter. And this time it broke down just about right down the middle. So we lost a lot of independent swing voters that we should have had. And frankly, Trey, I think that made the difference in about 15 House seats and four or five maybe uh, Senate seats that we could have uh, potentially picked up. And I think when you look at those independent voters, they like Biden, but they don't like the job he's doing. All the key issues aligned with Republicans. But there was a visceral dislike for the previous president and with some of the candidates we fielded. So you put those two factors together, the intensity level, the independent voters, and that's why we got the results we have today. All right, Congressman, I want to stay with the House. I want to play a clip from one of your colleagues and then ask you a question on the other side. Here's the deal. 
Um, we need to make a change in trajectory and change of path, change in process, change in procedure, change in policy. All those are not going to happen uh, with uh, the current leadership leader at the top. All right, Congressman, I heard the word change five times in one sentence. Um, what I did not hear is the word election, as in we've already had an election for who the speaker candidate will be. And, and when the congressman from Arizona refers to current leadership, how in the heck does he think they got there? Y'all elected them. So do, do elections matter in the House anymore or can we relitigate them anytime we want to? Trey, you're absolutely right. 85% <clears throat> of the Republicans voted for Kevin McCarthy to be the next speaker. <clears throat> Excuse me. 15% voted for Andy Big, Biggs. And by doing what they're doing with five or six people holding out, it just takes five to derail this because we need 218 votes, you know, roughly, to get Kevin McCarthy the speakership. But they don't even have a viable alternative that they're putting on the, on the floor. So it's just to say no without an alternative after 85% of the, the Republicans have selected Kevin, and right now I guarantee you, Trey, it's about 95% are with him. The, I've been a commander five times in the Air Force. I deployed four times. Teams win. And when a small number of people go against the team and breaks down the team, that's how you get beat. And by doing what they're doing, they're helping out Chuck Schumer, they're helping out Joe Biden, and they're helping out Hakeem Jeffries with, with these actions. And Kevin McCarthy has worked his butt off for four years to get us back in the majority. He's been in everybody's district. He's done more for each of us than anybody else has. He deserves this opportunity. I think he has a great vision and we gotta work as a team to get as much done as we can. And you know, Congressman, even if all of that is true, what you said about Representative McCarthy, and he had lost the election in November, then I would say, okay, he's not the nominee. He didn't win the primary. But he won it with 85% of the vote. And I, I, just, I mean, we've only got about 30 seconds. Do, do, do these five that don't want him, do they have somebody in mind? Well, that's my whole point, Trey. They have no alternative. They've put Andy Biggs back on the, on the table again for the vote on the floor. But we already know that he had 15% of vote, and it's going to be less now. Uh, those numbers, have, uh, some numbers have coalesced around uh, Kevin McCarthy. So... Now, they have put some demands out there that they want to negotiate. It's unfortunate to have to do demands within your own party with each other. Uh, we've already voted on a lot of the issues that they're wanting to change within the conference. They should support the majority, and in this case, the far majority of what they've already said they wanted to do. Well, Congressman, uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Um, I apologize for whatever role I played in getting you to Congress because it looks like a mess right now. I think you would be much happier in Nebraska. You got a new football coach. So my apologies to you. Thank you for joining us on a Sunday night, though. Thank you, sir. Hey, Sean Hannity here. Hey, click here to subscribe to Fox News YouTube page and catch our hottest interviews and most compelling analysis. You will not get it anywhere else.